Thanks. <laughs> Conflict happens. When there's more than one person in a room or in any kind of situation, we're going to have conflict, whether that's in our marriages, our families, our neighborhoods, our schools, our churches, our workplaces. There's going to be conflict. It's a natural, normal part of human life. So if it's a natural and normal part of human life, it's really important to look at how we deal with that. And one situation came up that maybe some of you have read about in the paper over the last little while. There was a, a basketball game between Holland High School and Lowell High School that took place on Valentine's Day. And depending on whose account you read, whether it's the Holland Sentinel or the Detroit Free Press or the Grand Rapids Press or hearing chatter on the streets, um, pulling together the essentials of what happened, this is the best I can come up with. Um, there, there was some kind of racial comments that were made, there was an altercation on the basketball court, some parents got involved, and the referees called an end to the game before the game was actually ready to be over. Now, what has happened in the wake of that is a typical, typical unfolding of how we handle conflict. One thing was we separated out the people who were involved, the referees called an end to the game, Another thing that happened is people were asked not to talk about it. And also, some experts were asked to come in and take a look to try to understand what happened. And that process is still going on right now. And that's often what we do. We want to separate people. We want to calm the conflict down. We want to bring in someone, whether it's the parents or the teacher or someone, the lawyers, the judges, someone who's going to come in and figure this out for us. And then they're going to tell us, who did something wrong and what did they deserve? So as a therapist for over 20 years in this community, I have seen my share of people who have been living with the fallout of this kind of way of dealing with conflict. I've seen people who are in enormous pain and really actually very stuck in their lives with anxiety and depression around conversations that never happened around a piece of understanding about why someone did something that they still can't quite grasp, not knowing how to move forward. And I ask myself, is this all we have? Is this the best we can do? And I've been wondering about that. And I'm not the only person who's been wondering about that. There's a man named Dominic Barter who lives in Rio de Janeiro. And he had some observations that he made. He was actually in the Netherlands, of all places, and he was watching two lovers on the street who were having a quarrel. People who could not have been closer, but what he noticed when they were having this quarrel was the more they were not understanding each other, the further apart they moved and the louder their voices got. So he noted this. And then when he moved to Rio, some probably very well-meaning friends were saying to him, oh, make sure you don't go here, make sure you don't go there. And I'm guessing that's because many of us know that Rio and Brazil have some of the most complicated living situations for human beings. There's the most gang-infested, violent, shanty towns in the world. So Dominic took all this information in and he wondered about it. He wondered, I wonder what would happen if I did something different than what I was seeing before me. And the wondering is something like this. It's a wondering that I have. What would happen if instead of separating, we actually moved toward conflict? What if we actually brought all the people who were impacted by a conflict together? What if in that bringing them together, we look to those people to hear each other, to listen, to hear what was going on with them in an effort to come to some kind of a better outcome? Because at the end of the day, we still all have to live together, like it or not. We're still neighbors. We still live in the same world. And how do we do that? So there's a process that Dominic came up with, and some of us here in Holland and in other places around the country have been learning. It's actually been going on in Brazil um, since the 90s, and it's just in the last three years um, 
coming into Western Europe and North America. And it's called restorative circles. And here's what it looks like. There's three parts. The first part is calling a pre-circle. The second part is the circle itself. The third part is the post-circle. So I'm going to give you an example that came from one of our local elementary schools where they're, doing, where they're using restorative circles as a way to solve conflict. So um, the best part about this is that the girl who called the circle is usually really shy, and she doesn't often speak up about anything. And what happened was she was playing on the playground with a friend who happened to be a boy. This was in fourth and fifth grade. And two other kids were kind of laughing and making some comments. And this was upsetting to this young girl. So she said to her teacher, I'd like to have a circle. So the teacher said, great. And the boys, who are used to a paradigm where we punish the people who were doing something wrong, were a little reluctant to get involved with the circle. But they agreed to do it. So there was the pre-circle, where this girl called for the circle. Then we had the circle itself. So we have the girl, and we have the two boys who are making the comments. And in this process of the circle, we ask three simple, straightforward questions. The first question, and it's asked of every person who's involved, every person who participated or is impacted by what happened. What is it you want known, and by whom, about how you are right now in relation to what happened. I'm going to say that one more time, because it's a little bit of a, a mouthful. What is it you want known, and by whom, about how you are right now in relation to what happened? So when this girl was asked that question, she said, I want you to know that I don't really like when you tease me. I was feeling really sad about it. So then the facilitator says to the boy, what did you hear is important to her? So that's a little different piece. You know, I've worked with people who have been in courtroom situations where they've been um, on the receiving end of a crime and they get to stand in the court and read their victim's impact statement. But they read that statement and they are just putting it out there. They don't get anything back. They don't know how it was received. And to me, that's an incomplete loop. So we're doing something different in a restorative circle. We're listening in a different way. We're actually listening so that we have the possibility of being moved by what we're hearing, that we might actually be impacted by it. So, I'm hurt by what you said, by what you did. This boy said back when I asked him, what did you hear? His comment was, you think I'm stupid and mean. Checking back with the girl, is that what you wanted understood? So we have this closed loop. Is that what you wanted understood? She said, no. I want you to know that I was really hurt. So then we went on. And every person who's in the circle has the chance to answer that first question. After that happens, we go to the second question. And the second question is this. Not instead of our usual, who did something wrong, we say, what is it you want known and by whom about what you were looking for at the time you chose to act? And I'll say it again. What is it, you, what is it that you want known and by whom about what you were looking for at the time you chose to act? So in this case, one of the boys said, well, you know what? Actually, we were just goofing around and I wasn't even paying attention to whether that hurt your feelings or not. And now that I heard you, I'm thinking about times where I've been teased, and I really don't like it at all. And we check, what is it that you heard? Is that what you wanted understood? So we've got that closed loop again. And everybody, again, has the chance to answer that question. After that's happened, we move to the third stage of the circle, where there's a different question than what we normally ask. Instead of who deserves punishment and what's that punishment going to be, we say, okay, how do we move forward from here? We've heard each other. Everybody knows where the other people are at. We've all felt understood. How do we move forward? 
And a way I like to ask that is, what is it that you would like to offer? And what is it that you'd like to request? So again, everyone has the chance to answer that. And in this case, these kids came up with um, a solution of their own that worked for them. And that was, they decided that they would stay away from each other on the playground for the next two weeks. And that the two boys, they came up with an agreement between each other that if they noticed the other person going into a teasing mode of other people, they would call each other on it. So there's a direct, measurable outcome. It's not, we're going to be nice. It's specific behaviors, an action plan, as we call it, in restorative circles. So after that happens, we don't just leave it hanging there. We come up with a time to meet together again to follow up and see what happened. And that's that third piece over here, the post circle. So the post circle, we all come back together again. And instead of saying, did you do those things that you said you were going to do, we're going to hold you accountable to it, we say something else. We say, how are people with, with the actions? Did those seem to work in the way that you hoped they would? Because sometimes we can come up with some actions for people, and maybe they'll do every single thing on that list, and we still don't feel right. And sometimes with the list of actions, people don't do anything on it, and everybody still feels fine and is ready to move ahead. So we want to check that in the post circle. So thinking about some of the outcomes that can happen, I think about all of the, again, I go back to my office and my experience there, and I think, what would happen with all of that creative energy, with all of that human power, with all of that potential that each of us has, if it was unblocked by, by helping find a way through conflict? If these things that we get irritated about and angry about and frustrated and want other people to hear, if that could actually happen so we could kind of undam the river and let that free flow move through. There was... a situation at Hope College, a racial incident, and they decided to try using a restorative circle. And without going into the details of it, I'm going to tell you what was the most powerful piece in all of that to me. We got through the pre-circle and the circle itself. I think we pre-circled over 250 people. We had the circle itself, we had the post-circle, and after the post-circle, I was standing off to the side, having a conversation with someone, and I noticed, standing over here, the author of the act, the person who did the thing that created so much pain, and the person who had actually been experiencing the most pain around it through the whole process, they were standing over on the side chatting about when they were going to have coffee to keep talking. And to me, that's remarkable. Because the reality is, when we have conflict, we still have to live together. We're not going to all sing kumbaya and hold hands and love each other at the end of this, necessarily. But we need to find a way to move ahead with our lives. So I love the possibility. Something else that I really love about restorative circles is the inherent trust in our own ability, our own capacity to be creative and to know what we need. We don't need to bring in people from the outside when we're asked. When we're asked about what's important to us, when we're asked about how are we going to do this, we can come up with it. There's an opportunity to understand where other people are coming from. So I wonder to myself, what kind of a world would it be? You know, we're we're working right now. There's a group of us here in Holland that practice this and that use these in the community. We're working with Grand Haven and Spring Lake Public Schools. There's a group at Black River that are working on this. The um, community policing officers in the Holland Police Department have been trained in it. We're talking about maybe doing something with teen court. Um, there are a couple of congregations in town that are using this. And I wonder to myself, what would it look like if in our community, 
There were so many people who knew how to do this, because it's not rocket science. You don't need an MBA or a PhD to be able to do it. What if there were so many people that knew how to do this that the very way that we all perceived conflict would be transformed? What would it be like if I said, oh, great, here's a conflict? <laughs> I say, oh, great, because you know what? It's going to help me understand more about what really is happening in my community. When I'm quiet about it, when I'm telling other people to be quiet about it, when I don't want to hear about it, it's still going on. I just don't know. So what if I knew, wow, I can find out what really is happening here. I can find out how people really are experiencing things. And when I find that out, I can actually take some action to start making a difference. So that's my vision. Just that wish that everybody would have access to this. This is not a 503C or a program. This is a, it's a social intervention. And in fact, there's an organization in the United Kingdom called NESTA, the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts. And what they are really is a think tank for social innovation. And they looked at all these different processes around the world, and they named restorative circles this process and what has unfolded in Brazil as a result as being, they called it, um, a radically efficient social technology. Radically efficient because in terms of public expense, very low cost. And in terms of payoff for community and for human well-being, huge. So, I'm going to ask you right now, imagine yourself in all the places that you encounter in your everyday life. I want you to think about whether it's your family, your workplace, your neighborhood, your community. Where are the places where you are experiencing conflict, where conflict is happening? Because it's there. And I want you to wonder with me, what would be possible if instead of backing away, you chose to take a step toward, move toward conflict with curiosity? Thank you.